CVE is my favorite topic. Um, again, disclaimer. People made me put that here. Um, five years ago, at this conference, like to the day, I gave a talk about how CVEs are dead. They mean nothing for the kernel. Ignore them. They're horrible. Um, I'm wrong. Things have changed in five years. Um, CVEs now mean something. And what, what radically changed was that CVE.org allowed open source projects to become a CNA and take charge of themselves. I want to call it the Python community for pushing for this and being the first ones to do it, and then documenting how any open source project can now become a CNA. That means we are now responsible for our own listing and identifying of vulnerabilities, and it means we don't rely on other people. It means other people can't tell us what they think. And so it's good. It's a little self-sustaining and whatnot. And thanks to the laws with the CRA and some U.S. governmental laws, um, we now have to do this if we want our software to be used. So there's a, document, a link to cve.org talking about this, a link to something I wrote about this. So we are a CNA, and that means we are now responsible for all kernel CVEs. And we are in charge. We rely on you to help us. But in the end, this is our responsibility. And we are responsible and required to document every single vulnerability that's fixed. This again, we are required. So some people can say, just stop doing that. I'm like, I can't. We are required to do this. And I put vulnerabilities in quotes on purpose. A vulnerability is a very, very specific thing. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But here's the resources. You can contact us. Uh, there's three of us that are working on this, cv.kernel.org. Uh, we have all the documentation for how this works. We have a public Git repo. You can see our work as it happens. You can see our reviews. You can see our documentation. You can see our tools. You can use our tools. Distros are using our tools to help them work better. Debian relies on the tools we've written. I'll talk about our tools a little bit later. And then you can also, if you just want to get a list of all our CVEs that have ever been published, there's a link. Um, you can dig around in cve.org. There's some Git repos as well. But there you go. Everything's in public, unlike before, which is good. We should be doing this stuff in public. So vulnerability, this is the official definition of what a vulnerability is. It's very vague. It's very difficult to figure that out. Um, the three of us who've been working on this for a while have come to guess and, and adjust our understanding of what is and what is not a vulnerability in the kernel. And here's kind of what we came up with, um, along with a lot of help from the security team and other people. Anything that user triggerable, crash or reboot, reboot's important. Uh, memory use up to free, leak, overflow, even if it's one byte. We have whole vulnerabilities determined by one byte. Boundary checks, denial service, logic errors, loads of other little things. Um, primarily, it doesn't mean that I have to document that it's exploitable, just that it is a vulnerability. That's very important because people are like, well, how do I exploit this? I'm like, I don't know. You figure that out. <laughs> it's a bug, we fixed it, we moved on. Especially at our layer. Linus has always said a bug is a bug is a bug treating for security bugs, this is at that layer. This is, we're at the layer where everything matters. Something goes wrong here, we reboot your machine, that's a denial of service, CV, way it goes. Um, the biggest one that people run into all the time, if you can ever trigger a warning, lots, a few billion Android devices run with panic on re unworn. I've finally gotten them to wean themselves off that, but then now it turns out all the cloud computing people run panic on warn, which is fine. They want to reboot the node in the way that goes. Um, so anything that can trigger a warning by a user use doing something gets a CVE. That's sorry. That's about half of them. <laughs> um, it's there. I don't know your use case. I'll talk more about that in the future. Um, what is not, and this is very important. People don't realize this. I lose your data. I corrupt your disk. I delete your disk. Not a vulnerability not a CVE. Yeah, I got quiet. <laughs> um, performance issues, of course. If I could drop your performance to nothing and crawl along, not a CVE, not a vulnerability. Um, bug fixes that you can't externally trigger very easily, not a CVE, yes. Why? Why is that not a CVE? Why is data corruption not a CVE? That is the definition that CVE.org has come up with. Talk to them. I got to live with that one. This is the security mindset of these organizations, and this is what they documented as. Don't know. Now, data corruption that we read from the disk, like a corrupted disk image, that you then do something with and cause a 
vulnerability, yes. But just delete all your data, clean zeros, no problem. <laughs> yes. What's the performance issue and what's a denial of service? Denial of service is I stop your machine. Or I prevent any networking sockets from coming in. Or I eat up all your memory. Eat up all your memory is a huge one. So that things slow down. But if I eat up all your memory, sometimes it, it's, it's tough. It's tough to figure it out, really. Uh, 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 uh. I would like to add also that um, if performance issues were considered as CV, given that many CV fixes will result in performance issues, <laughs> it could be recursive. <laughs> yes, the CV issues do result in uh, slowing things down. Um, yeah. So this is very important because we're fixing these. The simple curls. If you just try and cherry pick CVEs, you're not going to get them. People need to realize that. Um, we're assigning them after the fact. So stable kernels, we're looking at every single commit that goes into the stable kernel. That's 33 commits a day. Uh, we're usually a one to two week delay, depends on travel. A uh, number of us have been traveling for the last couple of weeks, so I think we're like two weeks behind. Um, and this also lets you update before the things are announced. There's a vulnerability, which is good. We want this to happen. Um, and we only reference the specific one fix. So if it took us 10 patches to get there, and then here's the fix, we're only going to say this is the fix. We didn't tell you about the 10 patches before that because they're in a stable tree and you should have just taken them. And we don't test them independently. The community tests these as a big block in the stable releases. Take them as a big block in the stable releases. Do not attempt to cherry pick these. Do not attempt to cherry pick these. You're going to hear that a lot. Um, and here's an example uh, from a couple weeks ago. Developers, uh, it's a little old. We were there at RC4. 10.6 was released, but the CPU reviews were at 10.4. That's how it goes. We the lag. It's a little bit of a lag, which is good. Um, along the lines of we cause performance degradation, all the hardware bugs are not given a CVE from us. We are not responsible. I'm not allowed. That's a cross company, it, or cross product issue. So Intel, AMD, ARM are responsible for the CVEs or Mitra for when they cover companies. So all the Spectra fixes that we've been fixing, which we have been fixing a lot of them, no CV identifiers from us. People need to realize that. Good luck trying to dig out of an Intel security announcement <laughs> which kernel, which 20 kernel patches it related to. They're just not doing it. Um, nothing I can do about that. So no hardware CVs. Please, please be aware of that. Good luck figuring it out. Um, any questions about what is is not a CVE? How do we do this? Right now, there's three of us. Um, me, Sasha Levin, and Lee Jones. Um, we each review every single commit that goes into stable tree in a different way. I read them all through an email reader. Uh, Sasha has some fun machine language tools, so he goes off and parses things and reads them all. Lee has some wonderful regular expression. It's just giant. And these is to highlight common problems. Um, all his tools for that are public. My tools are public. Um, Sasha's isn't, but that's Sasha. Um, and then we vote. I say, this is or is not. It's good. I just provide a list that is. Lee provides a list of this. Sasha provides a list of this. And we have some other people contributing at times. We've got at least 200 developers that are sending us their lists. We want more. I'm um, talking at the plumbers conference. I think we corralled somebody else into helping us as well. Um, we want people to give us those lists. What do you think is and is not a vulnerability? And then we look at them. We've got some tools that says, hey, look. Everybody agreed on these, wonderful, everybody didn't agree on these. And we allow, we can mark up the ones we disagree on, why we say they should or should not be. And then the ones that are all agreed upon, great, sign a CVE. The ones that disagree on, we'll discuss them over a little bit, come to agreement or just come to disagreement, say we want to sign those, and we move on. Next one. Again, 33 patches a day, 220 a week. A lot of work. Um, it's good. Um, we also have people ask us, hey, this is can I get a CVE for this? Happens a lot. A lot of developers fix the bugs. They want a CVE for their CVE. Wonderful. Give them that to them. Um, corporate request. Sousa, this, er this morning, just emailed me while I was in the back of the room saying, hey, this old bug that was fixed, can I get a CVE for it? I'm like, sure. Boom. You get it. We're actually faster than the old process. So Red Hat and Sousa and the distros like us. Just email them us. We give them the CVE. They can also email us and revoke the CVE because we got it wrong. So if we get this wrong, and, we, and it goes out, tell me, 
And most of the time, I'll, if it's obvious, yeah, you're right. We, we, we messed up on that one. I'll reject it, and away we go. Sometimes I'll argue back and say, hey, why do you think so? We'll discuss it, discuss it with the maintainers. If any maintainer of any code that's given a CVE objects, I don't think we've ever rejected that objection. Objected to that. So that's important. We're not going to email all the maintainers when we assign the CVE to their code because that's just more noise. But if you want to reject them, let us know and we will do that. I think we've done that a few times for some KVM ones. They're like, no, you really can't do this. Like, okay, it's fine. Meaning you can't cause the bugs there to happen. So that's it. So that's how we assign them. And we're averaging, it used to be 50, I think because we've been traveling now, it's about, or 60, now it's 55 a week. Our sign, so it's about 20% about overall. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of CVEs per week for when we used to have uh, 20 per quarter, right? Um, so needless to say, this has woken a lot of people up. Um, but we're not number one. <laughs> um, these numbers are actually interesting. The Chrome developers swore they were doing 20 to 30 a week. So they thought they were doing more than they really are. Chrome, those guys do release every other week. Um, WordPress, they're by far, but that's all the plugins. That's my, n nasty. Mitra and GitHub are accumulation of lots of smaller projects that ask for CVE, so it's not attached to one single one. Windows, 10 to 11 per week. Uh, I think 11 per week was for Windows 10, and 12 per week was for Windows 11. Um, Mac OS, again, 6. iOS, 2 to 3. That's what they're normally doing. It's, that's the normal usage of them. So we're not number one, but we are pretty high. And there's a lot of CVEs these days. There's a lot of them. People are worried about that. And um, Josh and Kurt, wrote a bit, they've been involved in the security community for a long, long time. We're going to say Red Hat and other companies. And there's a whole really good blog post. These are, will be in the slides. About why they have, CVEs have increased. It's across the board. It's not just us. Um, the thing I want people to remember is uh, we have to play this game in this world. So I have to sign these CVEs. If you were worried that there's too many CVEs going on, which there probably is, CVE doesn't really, it just identifies that there is a problem here. Not necessarily that's a security issue, just that there's a problem. Maybe we need to do something different. But that's up to the larger community of security and governments to work on. And I'll call out the EU. They are working on that. The EU is trying to set up something that's different than what CVE.org is. And that's good. Maybe we'll solve some of this progress going forward. But I looked and I saw the application process and it's going to be like two to three years from now just to get started. Um, but again, we're getting our work done in spite of CVEs, not because of them. Anyway, it's not just us. Um, but our CVEs that I give you are very, very good compared to what they used to be. They are, I was required, well we were required, because we became a new CNA, they made us abide by all the new rules. So I had to tell you what files are affected, when the bug came in, when it was fixed all our branches. We do this. So it's all in machine readable format. There's Git repos of it. Our public repo you can pull from the CVE list itself, all in JSON format. Um, we do not assign priorities. I'll talk about that. Or severities. But everything is there because not everything is applicable to you. But I tell you if it is or is not. Because you know what files you build, right? Hopefully. And you know what your use case is, hopefully. Between that, you can determine if a CVE is applicable to you or not. That's up for you to determine, not me. Because again, we're in what? Cow milking machines, satellites, airplanes, telecom centers, air traffic control servers. Linux is very unique in that we don't have a common use case. It's used so many different ways. All our 30 million lines of code are used in different ways. You don't use it all. So rely on the fact that we describe it for you. You can know what you're doing. You can apply it. Look at the intersection. Again, you don't know what you're, we don't, I don't know what you're doing, you know what you're doing. You know what files you're using. Use that. Some of these do pertain to, pertain to you. And ignoring them, we will tell you up front, it's not our problem, it's now yours. Governments are getting involved. I see report, uh, announcements from the US government every week saying, if you do not have this CVE fixed, you're in violation of other things. That's real. And those, use, those TVs are usually like three and four years old, which is sad. But um, they will affect your security, and that's why. The U.S. government reports are usually of known things are being exploited in the wild, which is also important. So again, as I tell everybody all the time, take everything. Take all the stable trees. Um, we test it all together. You get 
and you get the data corruption fixes. You want data corruption fixes, right? Data is what we use. You get all the performance increases. Take those things. I've said this for a decade here and other places. The case sent it last week, a couple days ago. A whole bunch of companies got together and had a boff about the CVE process. Not complaining about it, but what to do. And they're coming up with different use cases. So they're thinking maybe making a cloud server use case, and then they'll be able to score these based on that. Um, an embedded use case and whatnot. And I, I wish them well. I do. Um, but case says this. You know, you need to either figure out how to take all of them and reboot, or take a subset of them and reboot. You have to reboot. <laughs> um, you can do live patching up to a point. People do do live patching up to a point and reboot once or twice a month. I've talked to some major cloud providers. They can't reboot because their infrastructure can't handle that many reboots happening. <laughs> That's on them to fix. They know they need to fix it. They'll get there. But either way, either if you're going to triage these manually, it's going to be a lot of work, or if you have the infrastructure and take that, put that stuff in place, or just make the one-time investment so that you can reboot all the time. I'll call Android. Android has put the investment so that you can reboot all the time. Once a month, they merge the LTS kernels into their main, main branches and require their devices to accept it. Great, and then they cherry pick things in that one month period. That's a nice, moderate way to do that. But they've gone through the testing infrastructure in place to do this. So here's case saying things much better than me. So you can triage every 55 a week by hand, which some people are, because it's automatable, or you can fix your process and take updates. Your choice. You don't have a choice. <laughs> uh, I disagree with the first one because we, you would be missing all the intermediary fixes I, which are not tech CV. I agree with you and I disagree with you, but these are the choices that people want to have. So, so let's do this. I did this as an example. I took a week. Six, uh, whenever 6.49 came out, um, Again, all the commits, all the CVs are for the latest kernel, and then we see what's applicable to older ones. So there's only 94 commits now released. There's only 19 CVEs that week. Perfect. I looked at what Android builds, because Android has a common kernel that all devices use. Um, four, 19, it happened to be number 19 again, of those 94 commits, actually Android built. We have a list of all the files you know which build, you know what header files you touch, boom. So four of them was the intersection, and the four Trivial to review. 18 lines inserted, six lines deleted. Or five lines deleted. Um, this isn't a lot of work. <laughs> and then once a month, they sync up again. So if the case they reviewed those incorrectly, which is their fail-safe. So do a fail-safe like that. You can do a mix of these things. You don't have to just say, I'm going to triage everything. You can do both. Again, this is automatable. I talked to another big cloud provider, and they have it all automatic. Auto automated just spits out on a weekly basis, what the people need to review, they review them and go on, and then they hopefully sync back up again. This is real world. And these are real bugs. SE Linux one was nasty. You can bypass all of SE Linux. Real fix. DWC3 caused, oops, anyway. We're fixing these all the time. We've been fixing these for decades. Now it's out, things are being called out more, which is cool. Um, anything else on the whole process? I went fast. Yeah. Uh, two questions. The first one is uh, for warnings. Does it depend if you have, for instance, advanced enable or debug options enable? Second, if, if that's true, so there are a lot of like UBSAN or KSAN problems that did not have fixes, so should we open a CVE for a problem that does not have a fix? Um, the first one, yes, some subsystems, I'll call out MM, call some file systems, they have enabled debug options, and if the debug options are enabled, they will spit out warnings. We do not create CVEs for that. Those communities have said no. So MM warnings, we do not do that for, because those should not be running in production. Locked up, locked up enabled warnings, we do not do because you should not be running locked up in production. If you are, you got other issues, <laughs> but um, that's it. So, and as to the second thing, um, yeah. 
Um, we don't like assigning a CVE to an issue that isn't fixed. I can assign a CVE to an issue that isn't fixed if I know it's being exploited, or if I know it's actually causing the problem, or if it's just an accounting nightmare for you. If, you. if it makes it easier for you from an accounting point of view, great, I can do that. Um, we don't like it. Our tools don't make it easy. Uh, CVE.org does not like that, usually. There's some very strict rules about unfixed issues. Um, but there are rules that we have to assign them if you want to. But I'm not going to do it for all SysBot stuff. I'm not going to do it for all the UBSAN stuff. Fix them. Give us the resources and fix them. So we do mark all of those as actually CVEs. And usually it's after the fact. So. In front. So I'm just going to poke the bear a bit. Why is data corruption not considered a denial of service? This is up to cbd.org. Don't talk to me. Okay. I don't agree with it. It's not my decision. Uh, what's the problem with unfixed uh, issues? Why not? Why SCV is not wanted? Um, because I want them fixed. Yeah, <laughs> but if the fix is not trivial? I can do it. it. It is possible to do it. It's just an accounting nightmare because then all the people on the ecosystem that consume CVEs will be like, where's the fix? Where's the fix? Where's the fix? And it, it just, I mean, system, the whole CVE infrastructure is set up to associate with effects. It can be done, and I do it, usually only if I have to do it. Okay, thank you. I mean, I don't want to break people's accounting that much. Cool. All right, let's talk about some tools we have. Um, this is automated. Um, we got a tool called Dyad, which, given a git commit, finds what it commit fixes and what it fixed is in all our branches. And that's a non-trivial test. <laughs> um, our kernel branches are not inherited from each other. When a stable branches off and branches off and branches off, we inherit things and we hopefully tag them properly. But here's an example of the output, and I do it with version number and git commit IDs, version number and git commit IDs. Um, it can detect from the beginning of time. It can detect if things are not fixed yet, too. Things are vulnerable. We have a lot of branches that are still vulnerable. I believe those. It can document all that. It does all that. This is a great machine-readable format. Debian uses this to consume for a lot of its reports. Other tools we have use this to consume. And this tool was the most of our worry. Um, we don't know how to type. Um, in Valid, we have fixes tags that go forward in time. We have cherry picks that say, I'm cherry picking from a commit that will show up in a year. Um, it's all over the place. We have things going backwards in time. We have Things that are vulnerable only in some branches, but not others, but yet they really are in another branch. Um, no fixes, despite they really said they were fixing it. Um, incorrect data all the place. We have, this thing has gotten really good in mining the tools. It's like 200 lines of very, very horrible bash. Um, please fix it for me if you see some bugs. Um, if you know some horrible git IDs, give it to me. I have a wonderful big regression test feed that proves what, that if whenever we hack on this that it doesn't break anything. Um, but our commits are a mess. If nothing else happens, this tool will help us over time anyway. It's an awesome tool. Um, we have a tool that takes that output called Dippy, um, and it creates a CV record, either in JSON format or MBOX format that I mail out, or both. Because JSON formats get updated over time. As we do stable releases, we will update the JSON formats and um, push them out to the JSON database from cv.org. I don't update the MBOXs and push it out to new messages all the time. It doesn't make sense, but you can always query the JSON and get the correct information. Um, big, long thing. In our repo, there's a big how-to. Lee Jones wrote it up. How to use all these tools if you want to. Works out really well. And finally, we got a tool called Struth. A tool to show how vulnerable you are. Whether give it a get any git commit ID. It doesn't have to be just a tag. It'll show you how many open CVEs there are for that one. Or, no, sorry, how many assigned CVEs are not fixed at that point in time. And you can do also what is fixed in this specific release. And this is a point in time, because remember, we backport things over time. So um, things, and we assign things backwards in time as well. So this is at this moment now. It's not as this moment forever. So always remember that. Things will change over time. 
You can't say, great, I'm only vulnerable to the three CVEs now, and forget about it for a year. They will become vulnerable over time. Um, yeah, got cool tools. Um, again, all written in Bash. Um, some of them are a little slow. We need to make them fish faster. We abuse the file system as a database. We've used Git as a database. Um, it kind of works. Works good enough. And again, cases, quote, I'm going to leave that as that last thing. And hey, not bad time. Everybody's asleep. Nothing else? I got one bonus slide. So case came up with this list at last week. Um, these are things we all seem to agree on. We agree that we want to run the safest kernels. We all agree CVEs are not perfect mapping. They are an imperfect mapping. They're all we have right now, so we got to work with them. Um, before kernel we became a CNA, tons and tons of flaws were being fixed and never assigned a CVE. So we had a huge number of false negatives, gigantic number of false negatives that we're proving. Now that we're CNA, we do have some false positives. That's fine. Our false positive rate is very tiny. I, don't, I think I did it. One, maybe 2% are being rejected. Either that means nobody's reviewing them, which they are. I will call it SUSE. It does a really good review. SUSE says, hey, are you sure you're right about this stuff? Um, so because we've done this, now there's a huge drop in false negatives and a huge and a small bump in false positives. So overall, People have come to the conclusion that this is a net benefit to the system. It's causing a lot of work for companies, causes a lot of wake-up, but I hope that everybody seemed to agree at this big giant meeting a couple days ago, this has gotten better. And Case is going to write up a whole big white paper on this to make it a little more um, documented and you can point it at people at this and stuff like that. But um, he did a good job in summarizing this. I think this is really, really true. Feels free to disagree. I'd love to talk about it. Again, we can talk about it. The old way of doing CVEs was behind a black box, and one company was abusing them as a detriment to everybody else. And now they're not. I don't want to come give another CVE talk. <laughs> Help it. Then give a technical talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, I work for AWS, and one problem we have with the kind of new way, I mean, not in a new way, but sometimes, for example, CVEs would not apply to a certain kernel, right? And we get our automated triage to say, okay, we're not impacted, but actually we may have backported something from yeah. newer kernels, and then we're not gonna be like technically vulnerable, right? Because the systems don't say we are, but in reality we are. So that's kind of one of the problems we have right now, right? So, uh, so we need alone. something like your diet tool, right? Yeah, you're not alone, so use that. And use that in point of metric branches. Um, Android does that. Android backports a lot of stuff. And they do a, a sweep once a month of saying, hey, where are all the fixes for the stuff we backported? If you guys have not been doing that already, you're, you already are very buggy and vulnerable as it is. Basically, we're doing manual assessment. Yeah, you should, it should not be a manual process. We have the tools. They're, they're clunky and whatnot. Let's make them better. I only have a common place that everybody can contribute to and make these tools better. The enterprise distros do have a problem. That's self-inflicted, and I have no sympathy. <laughs> if they want to support something for a decade or two decades and backport that stuff because somebody's afraid of bumping that version number, that's work they're getting paid for. They now have the tools to handle this, but it's, that's what they're getting paid for. <laughs> um, as a community, it's not, my, it's not my fault. It's not my issue. I'm now finally reporting these problems. So the governments are happy. Hopefully your customers will be happy as well. But it's causing some bumps. There's a lot of churn in some of the ecosystems. I know I'm going to be quoted on the no sympathy. Um, you talked about tooling. I think the tool was called Track to to give the number of CVs that a given kernel version might have. Um, does it take into account your current configuration, for example? No. Or what, what files no. did you build into no. your kernel? Okay. No, no, this is just a current point in time, a current commit, what has been assigned. It just uses, looks at the output of Dyad. Now, you can take this, and I did that for Android, and looked at, found the intersection really easy. So you can take the output of this, look at the output. Because if you get a CVID, you, can, you know what files are affected. 
that. Now, configurations cannot be mapped to files. I think Julia had some graduate students, or somebody in Germany had some, there's a bunch of research papers trying to map configuration files to, config values to files. And you end up just reduplicating the whole build system. <laughs> so just look at the build. We have tools. I have a horrible shell script. Um, I wrote something else with eBPF. Steve helped me write something else that will monitor your build and spit out a list of all the files. You should know what files you're building anyway. So now take that tool, Android have that tool for forever, and look at the intersection. It's a very simple, it's a very simple Python script. I hate that. Okay. Uh, yeah. And configs, if you don't, are usually not in the middle of the file anyway. If you're building the file, something happens. So you're getting the whole file. I, uh, so I just wanted to clarify, you said earlier that uh, companies like Red Hat and SUSE are happy with the process no. because they can <laughs> submit the CVs. I wanted to clarify that that's only a tiny part and overall at least at SUSE we are not happy, but you already explained the problems of the enterprise kernel, so that's not, I don't want to argue about it now, but just wanted to clarify that we are not as happy as might have seen. I, I will call out Sousa as being unhappy, but actually being very helpful. You guys are one of the only distros that are helping me in review, so thank you. Um, I do know your problems. I spent a lot of time talking to people this past week in person. I do know the issues. Uh, Red Hat had the same issues. The ironic, well, semi-ironic part is the person who pushed the hardest for this to happen through cv.org is the head of Red Hat security, because he knew this was a real problem and was not being addressed. So Red, Red Hat's head of security helped us become a CNA to do this. Uh, uh, okay, and another thing, in the beginning you mentioned the five years old talk here, where, where I think you said that one of the options to fix the broken CNA uh, CV process would be to make every bug uh, a vulnerability and that would prove it wrong. So how do we know that's not what's happening now? We are not <laughs> doing we are doing exactly what cve.org asked us to do. They explicitly told me I had to do this. So there, if this is a denial of service on cve.org, it's self-inflicted, and it's something they asked for. We are a small drop in the bucket to the overall CVEs that are happening every week. Their tools didn't even blip when we get involved. Um, you saw those numbers. Uh, Mitra's put, pumping out 500 a week. Um, this is not a every bug. As I said, we review every one of these manually. Three different people, three different ways at least. It's about a 20% is what's hitting of what's in the tree. If we get them wrong, let us know. This is not everything. So we are not causing a denial of service. We're not making a CVE for every single commit. Kind of might feel like it, but it's 20%. And again, cv.org wants it. Five years ago, they did not want this. <laughs> uh, on HA proxy, we have a bugs page uh, with uh, an HTML page, uh, which is reviewed every day for uh, every single stable version, which lists all the bugs which are known on this version. So it's very comparable to what you are doing with uh, Strack. And um, I'm wondering if you considered putting it on uh, kernel.org, because for us, it's very convenient when we want to convince uh, a user to just update or they report a, a bug or a, a wrong behavior. It's easy to just point them to the link and say, hey, look, you have 500 bugs on your version. Uh, please update and come back later. Yeah, we could, but then I, gener I have to generate for every single stable version. Yeah and I played a giant web page. <laughs> I mean, every number of version over time. Yeah, I mean. It, yeah, it, Maybe Constantine could do it. Yeah, and to be fair, when you run it right now, it takes three minutes. <laughs> so um, again, it's written in bash. I, that actual slope down is the, is the point in time when I'm using git to compare this commit to this range. So over 3,000 ranges. Well, actually, it's double that. We should cache it better. We should make this better. It was, I got it to work. Now let's make it fast. I'm running on my laptop. Three minutes on my laptop. It's not going to be dynamic, but it can spit out a report once a day. In our case, it's just pre generated every day. That's yeah, all. Yeah. Maybe I can. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> anyway, no, it's good. I mean, people, lots of people have asked for that. So you're not the first one to ask. Maybe 
maybe I can say, hey, make sure you have that. It's also caught it. Like, we are now catching things that we forgot to backport. I'll call out Wind River for doing a great job of backporting CV fixes to older kernels that we still support because they realize they're vulnerable now. It's a little easier to notice. Um, I have another question. You talked about cv.org. What's their relationship with Mitre and uh, other, uh, let's yeah. say, organizations? So cv.org is, um, I think, run by Mitre? My, no. Mitre is the CNA under cv.org. I don't know the relationship between the two. They're both funded by a U.S. government agency above that. There's, well, no, NIST is NVD, which is off to the side, which is different. NVD does try and come along and give us a CSS score. They stop for a while, which had nothing to do with us. They just happen to be the same coinciding. Um, they're funded by another U.S. government agency. One of the big reasons that um, the EU is wanting to do their own, rightfully so, is they don't want to be reliant on the funding of a random U.S. government agency to run all of this. TV.org is working on that, maybe to become not reliant on the U.S. government, but right now. It's a really, I don't quite understand it all. And then there's some other U.S. government agency that funds all of those somehow, and I've talked to them as well, but they're like, work with them. So I, I don't know where the money comes from. They run a server, run a couple servers, and have some meetings. But it is a U.S. government agency, funded. Um, what about fixes that are discovered to be actually vulnerability fixes, but long after? Do you have any process to... Yeah, email me. Like happened today, somebody said, hey, this buggy fix, this commit that went in 2022, do you think it was a vulnerability? I was like, yeah, it was. Boom, here's a CV. No problem. It's actually trivial for me. These tools spit it out, and we needed to make it automatic. And it's, it uses the text for the change log message. Way it goes into the system. So email me. If you think something shouldn't be done, email me. We're now having people, don't email me before it hits a public release. Like if it hits Linus's tree before an RC release, um, we have to reference a specific release first. So maybe wait a week. But I, I can also queue them up. Queue them up for lots of developers. So that a week later, we spit them all out. Willie's got something up here. In initially, when you announced the new process, there were a lot of complaints about it uh, uh, going to break everyone's uh, workflow, etc. And we even had some uh, heated discussion on the security list. Yeah. Um, do, uh, do you still get some negative feedback, or did uh, some uh, people uh, change their mind after adapting their process? Or, uh, did you get some f positive feedback, even people considering that, after all, uh, maybe it's better for them? So I have gotten feedback. Um, it has caused additional process with SUSE mm -hmm. due to the way they had things infrastructure. It caused additional process at Red Hat. Uh, it made Debian very, very happy. <laughs> um, last week at the conferences, people were like, I want to talk about CS and CVs, and I'd flinch. Um, but half of them were like, this is better. So I will call out AWS as both having problems and making things better, depending on what part of AWS you were. One division is very, very happy. The other division is like, hey, this is a lot more work. Um, so again, it depends on what you do. I think as the companies come together, I mean, there should be a common way to score these for an enterprise distro, see what the subset that they care about so they know how to back for it. So Red Hat and SUSE and some of the other cloud people should be getting together and maybe in a public way, picking which ones they care about. And that's great. Do that as a community base. Or just take them all. That's, personally, I think it's a little faster and easier that way. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I got I got mixed bag. But overall, I mean, these are things that, it's not like we weren't doing this whole long anyway. We were fixing these. That, these bugs have always been fixed. So it's just shining a light on it. And while that might be troublesome to some people because they didn't want to show that, shine a light on it, we're not hiding here. And that's good. And we're also getting better. So I will call it. I see every single bug. So I'll, I'll specifically say, I think Rust is going to help us. It'll fix up all the error handling bugs. Um, Rust, when it detects memory, when you do bad things in memory, it just reboots the box. So again, you will get CVE, but you won't be able to make a vulnerability out of it, which doesn't matter. So it won't keep your box from rebooting, but there's a whole class of things that Rust can actually help us on from a security point of view. Over the next 20 years, I think we're going to have to do just 
let's see these. I see so many common errors. These are all so trivial. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me.